coming. Um, it is my pleasure today to introduce Jessica Flack, who is the co-director of the Center for Computing and Collective Computation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Jessica studied at Cornell, then did her PhD at Emory, studying um, animal behavior, evolutionary theory, and cognitive science. And uh, I first met Jessica uh, at SFI, where she was a resident for almost 10 years. At first as a postdoc and then as a professor. Um, and you know, the, the first time I met Jessica, she talked, it was uh, one of her talks, and she talks about a behavioral knockout study where um, she took certain powerful individuals um, out of um, a social system and, and, and looked at the system robustness um, in, in that animal society. And um, uh, you know, some I, I you know I thought then and I still think now that some of the best talks are the ones where afterwards uh, you go, oh that, you know, after the speaker finishes their story, you go, oh that's so cool. I wish I would have done that. I wish you know, I would study that, and that was definitely my, you know, how I felt after Jessica's talk, and I don't want to, you know, make it raise everyone's expectations too high, and I'm going to let Jessica, <laughs> Jessica tell us about collective computation today. Okay. Well, thank you, Mona and Mark, for inviting me here. It's a really a pleasure um, to be at Stanford, especially since this morning, my husband is snowing. Thank you all so for coming today, and uh, I guess it's the conference. So uh, a couple things before I start. I tend to speak very fast. So if I'm speaking too fast, please just interrupt and tell me to slow down. And also, um, when I'm tired, I got in at 2 a.m. last night. It was so slow. I sometimes drop words. You see me struggling with a word? Just tell me what it is, because I'm sure you'll be able to figure it out. It's usually the simplest words that I drop. So, OK. So what I want to do is I want to start with three videos. They're um, range in length from a minute to about five minutes long just to give you a sense of some of the phenomena that I find really fascinating in the world. And also because even though they're written in quite different videos, they share some important similarities. <laughs>
an old video from uh, narrated by David Jerome, number two, wants to show that he counts too. And Nicky knows this. Nicky and Jerome have been close partners for years. And now and then they impress this on the colony by going round and beating up one or two of their subjects. Greeting Nikki politely. Amber being servile towards Jerome. But in the first place, they pay their respects towards Nikki, like Jimmy here. That's another camera. Another one that's good. Also greeting Nikki. But ignoring Jerome. Someone else doing the same thing. doing her best to carry favor. Where there's a fight, Nikki intervenes. That's part of his job as leader. for about, you know, two, about eight, 800 minutes and you get some you know, interesting structure arising out of the interactions at the component level. And the reason I've got these uh, four videos and all these other examples up on this slide is because of what they share in common. And in terms of what I'm interested in, they all have multiple temporal and spatial scales. They all have interesting collective behavior or, or behavior at the aggregate level, some pattern formation of some kind, which 
chimpanzee case, that was harder to see because, as I said, the individual's uh, power structures, which is the interesting pattern at the group level, is arising out of individual interactions. When um, chimpanzees, two chimpanzees have a history of fighting, one learns it's likely to lose. When it perceives that asymmetry, and, and it gives the, um, the other animal perceives to be stronger, a subordination signal. And this produces a contra uh, network of subordination signals, and encoded in this network is the power structure. And the individuals know something about their relative power scores, how they know that we don't yet know. But um, the distribution of power when it's heavy tail, when it's a long tail, makes possible novel conflict management mechanisms. So I just explained that one because it's a little harder to see what the interesting aggregate pattern is and what the functional consequences of that aggregate pattern are. But all of these examples, like I said, have multiple temporal and spatial scales. They have interesting collective behavior or aggregate level patterns. And that arises from component or individual interactions where the components have partly conflicting interests or only partly overlapping interests. And of course, most of the work um, on this has been either in pattern formation or, and you may have, I think you've heard Ian Cousin give a talk on collective behavior recently in a seminar series, so that's of course related to this talk. And the, and the other place where there's been a lot of work on, on why you get these aggregations is of course social And the focus there has been almost entirely um, on the cost, ben cost and benefits of cooperation, as we here in, in, uh, in its emphasis. There's been almost no work on um, developmental dynamics or construction dynamics what I'm going to talk about in terms of collective computation of how macroscopic observables, functional, functionally important group level properties or functionally important aspects of social structure arise from component interactions. The one exception to this, and this is why I have the, uh, one of the reasons why I have that fruit fly video up, is, is that much of the good micro to macro work has been in the field of the evolution of development, where people work on the GP. And um, just to give you some sense of what my idea of good work in this area is, of course, there's a lot of good work, but this is my favorite example. I've got some slides from Eric Davison's lab at Caltech on the evolution of echinoderms. So we have sea urchin and starfish. And um, one of the things that his group is interested in explaining is the specification or position of cells in the endomembrane. So that's, that's this down here. And this is one note, very simple phenotypic feature. And as you'll see, it's even more simple than uh, seems to be the case here, because here's the gene regulatory architecture of the sea urchin. And this circuit, describes the gene, gene, gene protein interactions that produce that trait, that sort of feature, um, at 30 hours since birth, right? So all this complexity to explain that simple phenotypic feature and at this one moment in time. Now, I think the map, the, the circuit is great, so it's essentially a circuit specifying the boolean rules for coordinating gene protein aspects of the sea urchin's body. And this is great and terrible in the following sense. It's great because it's this, um, very experimentally rigorous, rigorously produced circuit in which knockout and other kinds of studies have been used to figure out which genes might, um, regulate which other genes are supposed to. And so, you know, the edges in the, the, the edges in the circuit tell you about inhibition and, and um, catalytic events, and essentially it's a kind of causal network or circuit that can be responsible for that output. Now, it's terrible in the sense it's incredibly complicated, and we can't do much as theorists with this thing. What we really want um, is some kind of reduction on this circuit, so we understand these sort of basic logical principles. Or alternatively, and but not unrelated, you could go the way that Eric Davis and his colleagues go, and that is they build these circuits for different kinds of closely related organisms like the sea urchin and the starfish, and they look to see what subcircuits were conserved in phylogenetic. <coughs> and so that, that can tell you something about the you know interesting phylogenetic history of the evolution of the world. And so in the case of the sea urchin and the starfish, where you have these observable phenotypic features that you can make direct measurements on, it, knowing what the sort of phenotypic trait of the macroscopic observable is, the output of the circuit, if you like, is somewhat straightforward. And again, if you're thinking about this for um, something like the schooling fish, it's fairly straightforward too, because the output or the, um, the aggregate level behavior is something like the trajectory of this, this ball of fish moving through the water. Right, you can measure its velocity, its trajectory, and, and, and that's maybe what you want to explain. It's not so obvious here, as I alluded to with the chimpanzee example, where you have to make inferences about those macroscopic observables. The, the output, if you like, or the, um, the social structure. And so what is the functional macroscopic property here? Well, that's, that's a much harder question. And well, what I'm going to pose, the question I'm going to pose for the rest of today's talk is, can we construct from data Social circuits that map microscopic dynamics, dynamics at the individual level, to functional aggregate or macroscopic properties of social systems that we know are functionally important. Okay, so 
that are analogous to the penis of the the starfish, so the sea urchin case, or to the trajectory of the school of fish. That's important for its um, ability to avoid predators. Okay. So I want to be sort of explicit about this. We're thinking about this um, as, like, as the Arthasian group is, although they are not quite as explicit about it, as a kind of computation. So what does that mean? What would, an element, what would elements of computation be in social systems? So as I said, you have to have an output. An output is the functional macroscopic property. And we say it's an output of a collective computation. If it can take on values that are adaptive, the value, uh, adaptive or functional at the group level or individual level, and is a result of a distributed and coordinated sequence of individual or component interactions under the operation of a strategy set. And it's a stable output input values that converges and terminate in biologically relevant time. And um, what I mean by that is, is what the talk is going to be about. So you'll see what I mean by the operation of the strategy set as I go, go through my slides. Now, of course, there has to be some input. And the input we as the sort of scientists have to make guesses about what, what input is important to the output that's uh, our target. And it can be things like the number of individuals or components. It can be um, information about their characteristics, like their identity in the case of individuals in an animal society. The age sex compositions, composition. It can even be something like a neurophysiological state. So you think those kind, that kind of information might be relevant to your outcome. But you have to make an initial guess about that. And then, of course, um, if you're really thinking about this in computer science, you might be worried about a termination criterion. I'm not going to talk at all about this today, and I don't think it's um, so important. But we think about this in terms of um, an effective termination criterion. And by that, we mean something that can be achieved through a separation of time scales so that individuals, by maybe constructing their social environments, like you would a niche construction, um, have a stable background against which they can adapt into their strategies. So that separation of time scales give, gives something analogous to a termination criterion, we think, in computer science. But as I said, I'm talking about, I won't say much about that today. What I am going to focus on is the algorithm. And by that, I mean the procedure or set of steps for mapping the inputs to a functional set of outputs in finite time. So in the social case, social circuits, describing the combination of decision-making rules or strategies at the individual level that produces our target macroscopic property are functionally um, important part of social structure. Okay. So that's just a reminder of um, our definition of output. And the two examples of outputs that we work on in, um, in C4 are come, come from um, one of our model systems. And it's a large captive monkey group, which I'll say a little bit more about in a few slides. And the two properties that we work on, I just want to ground this notion of output, are um, distribution of flight sizes, which is a really simple one. And then this more complicated distribution of power, which you got some insight into when you saw the chimpanzee video. And as I said, the interesting thing about that is that heavy tail distribution seem to make possible new forms of conflict management as, a, uh, as strategies for individuals to use. And that um, significantly changes how individuals construct their social networks, those conflict management mechanisms. But I won't be talking about that one today. It's, it's the more complicated of the two. And we've made a lot more progress on making the circuits for the distribution of fight size. That's what I'm going to focus on. Okay, so just to be really straightforward, we have our deregulatory circuit in the, in the Eric Davison case, and the output of that circuit is the specification, the position of cells in the endomesoderm. It's basically the layer that essentially becomes the skin. And in our case, we're going to build a social circuit from the data, and our output is going to be the distribution of fight sizes. That's, we're trying to build circuits that explain this particular statistical property that's functionally important. In the so there are two ways that we can go about building circuits. The first, there may be more than two, but two obvious ways anyway. The first is experiment. So some kind of intervention on the system, knock out, knock down techniques like in the Eric Davison case. And the second is um, an approach that we've been developing in our group called inductive game theory, where the strategies used by individuals and their consequences for collective complex dynamics and macroscopic properties are derived computationally from highly resolved time series on competitive processes and then test it in simulation. So basically, we're going to extract the, the strategies from the data, and then we're going to build circuits, and we're going to test this. We're going to build generative models using the circuits. So we're going to test the circuits in simulation and see if they can recover our observables, our macroscopic observables. All right, so here's the basic procedure. We have to identify our target property, show it as the functional implications. And the reason that's important is you can imagine you can pick you know, any macroscopic property and it may not be relevant at all in your system, and that wouldn't be very useful. So in the same way that we sort of want to identify phenotypic traits that we think you know, are really legitimate 
traits, we, we, want, to, we want to, um, restrict our consideration of microscopic properties to ones that have some feedback consequences potentially in their rules. Okay, so we're going to extract the decision making rules and microscopic rules, and um, potentially also the payoff of the game structure, and I won't say much about that today, from the data. So basically the idea is individuals are locally optimizing, or optimizing in their local interactions, and this is producing social structure. Then we're going to build alternative circuits from the data, so that we can map those microscopic decision-making rules or strategies to our um, macroscopic property. And then we build generative models using the circuits obtained from the data to determine whether the models can recover the distribution of bite sizes of a long fraction that I had on the previous slide. And finally, I won't say much about this today, but this is a really important part of the process as well, we employ dimension reduction and coarse graining techniques to zero in on the circuit logic. So we don't want to end up with that really complicated gene regulatory architecture as in the Eric Davidson case, and he doesn't presumably want to end up with that either. We want something simpler, something that explains the basic logic of the mapping between that micro those microscopic, um, microscopic behavior and the, the trait of interest and the property of interest. Okay, so the example I'm going to use in terms of the data comes from um, a large socially housing impact society that's at the European National Primate Research Center. Got 84 individuals, I'll be talking about 47 of the social mature ones, because their, their behavior is, um, the juvenile uh, behavior is kind of random. And again, the output of the computation is just going to be the distribution of fight sizes, which you may see referred to as the long fraction. This is what the compound looks like. Okay, typical fight. This is um, a, a really short video of a typical fight involving um, three animals. One juvenile attacking an adult female and another juvenile intervening on behalf of the first juvenile. Okay, so I'll show you that again, you can see it. First juvenile, little bidirectional aggression, second juvenile joins in. That's a typical fight. And basically what we have are, in any one observation day, many of these fights separated by peaceful periods in which no one in the compound is fighting. And the fights can range in size from two animals to 30 animals, uh, approximately. And um, what you see here is just a sort of representation of the raw data. So starting at noon and ending at 8 p.m., you've got bars indicating um, fight size, the total number of individuals involved in a conflict. And the spaces between bars indicates a peaceful period when nobody in the group is fighting. And then these hashed lines are, are um, an observed to break, which has to happen. Not automated yet, this kind of data collection. Okay, so again, the output of the collect of the um, our computation is this, this distribution of fight sizes, which we call the long fraction, and um, that will reappear throughout the talk. I'm just um, not going to spend much time on this, just to show you that the um, distribution of fight sizes has implications for individuals. It is kind of functionally. Can you go back to explain the y-axis? Start with the time series as strategic, 
or that you think is strategic, meaning that you think that the events in the time series are not independent because of um, individuals implementing social strategies or components. Doesn't have to be social okay, so how do we move towards an algorithmic description? So how do individuals decide to join fights? What are the decision-making rules? And how does the collective implementation of the combination of strategies that individuals use lead to the fight size distribution? So there are many reasons why an individual might decide to join a fight. Perhaps, fights, perhaps the um, decision to join a fight is, is, um, is random. Or um, so essentially, um, individual decisions are independent. See, the expectation is that any apparent correlations in the time series are, are due to chance, or simply to high frequency actors that are uh, just like to like, but are basically unquarterly, um, not causally acting on, no, I'm sorry, not causally related to any other individuals. And we can rule these kinds of things out, as you'll see in a minute, using normal models. The decision to join a fight can also be opportunistic. So you might be, you know, young adult males often form coalitions, and these things fluctuate in time. Um, they're not, they're, they're not very persistent. And so the expectation is that if this is the case, the apparent correlations can also be ruled out by certain kinds of novel models. The decision to join a fight can be environmentally driven, and here the expectation is that there are no significant correlations in the time series of um, fight participation vectors, like I showed you on the previous slide, unless we posit very specific models. And then the last two are strategic. So you could, if you're deciding to join a fight, it could be in response to inter-fight behavior. So meaning what your allies and adversaries were doing in previous fights triggers through some contagion mechanism or some other kind of social mechanism um, you to avoid or join the next fight. And of course, the expectation is that there'll be a correlation across fights in participation. And of course, your um, decision to join could also be very similarly in response to the inter-fight behavior. So who's involved in the present fight? Because of course, these, uh, the way these fights in the system work is that they're, they're um, often sequential. So two individuals will fight, and, and one of them will be direct to a third, and maybe the first will drop out, and the third will fight with a fourth individual, and then maybe target the second, and so forth. So you get these little sequences of two and four individuals uh, fighting for some time, and, uh, and maybe growing to involve eventually 30 individuals, but not simultaneously. So you could also be deciding to join a fight based on what's going on in the present. We're not gonna, I'm not going to talk at all about this today, but it's, it's um, the same, essentially the same question as, as this one, which is what I will focus on. It just uh, uses slightly different data. The structure of the analysis would be uh, identical. Okay, so let's say that your decision to join the fight was strategic. And then we have this expectation that there'll be a correlation across fights in membership. So it's strategic in response to inter-fight behavior of your allies and adversaries. So what kinds of, um, what kinds of correlations might we expect? So groups of M individuals, a little bit more formally, decide what to do in bout T plus 1 based on the appearance of N individuals in bout T. So we write this down. We call this, this is the causal model. We can note causal is C, where um, N and M, N specifies the number of individuals in the previous fight, and M specifies the number of individuals deciding what to do in the present place. And we, we can describe all of the strategies in this CNM model space in terms of this Markovian resource like this, where on this axis you have increasing coordination burden, and on this axis increasing memory burden. And the idea is that the more individuals you have to um, remember, you have to coordinate with, or not coordinate actively, but you have to, who also have to join the fight in order for this strategy to happen, as that increases with this coordination burden. And as you have to remember more individuals in the previous fight they did, you have this increase in computational or memory burden. So you can, you can think of this as a kind of Markovian resource lab that tells you something about the difficulty or complexity in a very crude sense of the strategies. And note that what I'm talking about here is a first order Markov process. So we're just at this, in this slide, we're just talking about fights that are adjacent, where the previous fight is predicting membership in the next fight. And we are going to limit the search for strategies of this type in our time series to these strategies at the top of the lattice. And the reason we do that is because it's cognitively parsimonious for this system and computationally feasible for us as the, as the uh, scientists doing the uh, analysis. So by cognitively parsimonious, I mean the search base that we could 
consider, the search space of potential strategies like this that we could look over is very large. And um, we need a way to restrict that space. And one of the ways we approach that problem is to think, well, from the point of view of, of our study com system components or individuals, they're, they're the ones using these strategies. So what is cognitive parsimonious based on what we know about their cognitive goals? What kind of strategies do the data suggest they could be using? And that's how we circumscribe this search space. And that also helps us out computationally, because if we were to explore this full space of traps, um, um, try to explore this full space of strategies, it would be computationally feasible. So that's this is sort of, if you like, um, somewhat related to machine learning ideas, but kind of biologically um, or cognitively restricted machine learning. Or some people, David would say, um, my collaborator, in intelligent machine learning. I think that's a bit unfair. Okay. We can also easily um, extend this framework to accommodate higher order Markov processes, though I, I will not be talking about those today. So the basic idea is that instead of the CNM, you have CNP and so forth. And um, you know, decision of P to fight depends on n behavior of T minus 1 and n behavior of T minus 1. Alright. So the first step in testing the CNM um, model space, or to look for CNM um, strategies in the data, is to search for directed correlations across complex. And of course, they're directed because of the error of time, right? Um, individuals here cannot influence participation here, by definition. So essentially, we're going to be looking to see if these correlations that appear to occur in the data are, are genuine. And um, we're going to begin with the simplest directed correlations that correspond to our simple um, Markov, first order Markov um, strategy, C11, C21, and C12. And so uh, let me just, I should have said what, what the, sort of colloquial meaning of these strategies. So C11 essentially means that I decide to fight based on the appearance of a particular individual in the previous fight. So I might decide to fight because Mark fought previously. Or I decide to fight because I decide to avoid the fight because Mark avoided the fight previously. I uh, was present in the fight. And C12 would be Mark and I decide to fight because somebody was <coughs> present in the previous fight. Or Mark and I avoid the fight because somebody was present in the previous fight, and so forth. So um, the so the way we look for these correlations is we, is there chalk up here? Is there any chalk? Okay, so pairwise, A in fight T predicts B in fight T plus 1. So that's just a very simple pairwise correlation. Triadic for the um, C21 strategy is just A, B goes to C, meaning A and B in fight T predicts C in fight T plus 1. And finally, um, the C12 is also triadic in the sense that A and A if by T predicts B and C if by T plus 1. Thank you. Okay, so you see we have pairwise and triadic strategies here. Individuals are, are making their decisions to join or avoid, avoid fights based on um, their relationships to um, in, in pairwise interactions and their triadic relationships. And I just want to point out, I guess not everybody can see, that of course, um, this is sort of obvious, but the, the, there are four transition probabilities. Right, so my failure to appear in fight T um, predicts your failure to appear in T plus 1. My failure to appear predicts your appearance and so forth. We're only considering two of these four um, transition probabilities. And that is this one and this one. And for those of you who are interested, um, that is because we're only considering that these um, two of these four transition probabilities, you cannot, you cannot think about this measure in terms of mutual information. And it's related to mutual information, but you can't, um, you can't, uh, it's not a doubt in terms of, of that. We're only considering a subset of the space of transition probabilities. Why is that? Why are you only considering those two? Uh, because in this group, there are 48 animals. 47 with 47 animals, and um, the effective transition probability for uh, 47 animals not appear, 46 animals not 47 animals not appear here predicting, and animals appear here is very very small. Yeah. So it's not it doesn't make sense why it makes any use in this system. It might make sense. Okay. So again, we have our schematic. So there are, now we, we're looking for these correlations in the data, these directed correlations. How do we know they're causal? There are lots of explanations for the correlations, and we need to worry about them. So, um, for example, could you be curious because B decides to join the fight at T plus 1 because C was in the fight, and it frequently occurs with C. 
In other words, if, if Mark and I always fight together, and, um, and I predict um, one of your appearances in the next fight, well, how do you know whether that's because it was me or Mark, right? It's really straightforward. So this turned out to be extremely rare in our data, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, it could be upstream curious, curious in the sense that B decided to join the fight at T plus one because A was in the fight at T and C was in the fight at T minus one. So this is essentially that higher order Markov process model I mentioned a few slides ago, CMP. And in this system, it's not really cognitively parsimonious, but you could you could rule this, you could test this um, model as well with the with the approach that I'm, I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, simple spurious correlation is just that B joins irrespective of A, but A and B are correlated because A fights all the time. All right, we can rule that out by our null models. And chance, B joins irrespective of A, and B are chance. We can also rule that out. I'll show you how now. Okay, and finally the causal model, which is that B decides to join the fight at T plus 1 because A is in the fight at T. So um, just simply to rule out spurious and chance correlations, what we do is we take the time series and we randomly shuffle conflict events, leaving their internal structure intact. So we're basically moving those vectors around in the time series. So we're keeping the participation the same, but we're just changing um, when those fights or those particular compositions occur. And we just, it's uh, really simple. All we do is calculate these quantities for each of the, those directly correlations. And it's just the number of times that B follows A minus the number of times that B follows A in the null, the shuffle null, divided by the time, divided by the number of times that, um, that A occurs in the data. And it's the same logic for all three. And, um, and in this way, we get, we can, we can, uh, we extract what we call delta P. And these are the significant correlations, and we call these the strategies. And what we find, um, is that, so the, the rule is that any number of significant delta P for CNN, any number, so even if there's a large space potential um, strategies of each type, in principle there's a, a huge number of them, and it gets larger um, for each of the, as you go through triadic strategies. But any number of them is evidence that individuals are using that strategy, because we're employing this null and this significance criteria. So any number of significant delta P indicates that at least some of the individuals are playing that strategy some of the time. And what we find in this time series is that individuals use C11, C12, and C21. So they seem to be using all of those strategies. But the number of strategies, the number of significant delta P associated with these strategies is relatively small, especially compared to the total number of possible strategies. How many fights did you record? So the fight time series is about 1,100. And, uh, and so there are lots of model selection uh, issues that we deal with. Okay, so if it isn't apparent, we're talking about your causality at two different levels. So um, we're talking about at the microscopic level, in, in the sense of what is the cause of an individual's decision or subject's decision to join a fight? That's what we're calling it strategies, when it's, um, when it's uh, social mediated and, and, and not and, uh, can't be ruled out by any of those numbers. And of course, we're talking about coming back to our macroscopic observable, our output of the circuit that I'll, I'll be talking about for the next half of the talk. Um, the cause of the macroscopic property, essentially. So that's important to keep, to keep in your head as we go through. Okay. So how do we address this? So now we've extracted the strategies from the data. We have our list of significant um, strategies in terms of delta p's. And we find that um, we have strategies in each of those model classes, C11, C21, and C12. So now how do we capture the collective company, the common, how the combination of these strategies Results in um, results of that max to long fraction distribution of fight sizes. So we're going to try to construct a circuit that captures the way those strategies can be collected and implemented. And we have since we have three types of strategy: one, 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 two, and two, one. We're going to construct three circuits from the data: one for each of these strategy classes. And these are probabilistic, so they're they're strategies in the game theoretic sense. But the circuits we're going to construct, since they consist of only um, one type of strategy are uh, only mixed in that one in that one sense. In principle, and some of you are working on now, you could also construct a strategy of multiple strategy classes, but that's computationally much harder, and that's why we need that important dimension reduction step. I'll say a little bit about that again. So essentially, we have our C11 circuit, our C21 circuit, and our C12 circuit. And what we have are delta, the, the significant delta p's we got from the data, and they have some value associated with them, and what we can do is use these delta p's to 
build a simple directed network in the case of C11 and something like a bipartite network in the case of C21 and C12. So just to show you what I mean by that, oh, one other important point is that the edges can of course be um, excitatory or inhibitory depending on whether the delta P is positive or negative. So if you remember talking about these transition probabilities, so one zero is negative and one one is positive. So here is our, um, here is the circuit, the circuit from the data that's supported by the data for C11. And uh, what we've got are nodes, so this is eosine, and, um, and we've got lines going in and out of eosine. And so the line, if the line's coming in, it means that this animal, VE, triggers eosine to fight the next time, in the next fight now. Okay, so eosine decides to fight because VE was present in the last fight with some other above what you expect by the <coughs> And if the line is dashed, that means that the um, interaction the, the, uh, you know, it's inhibitory. The causal relationship is inhibitory to the strategy. So um, for, for example, if um, Fantasia quest strategy is that if Fantasia occurred in the previous fight, he's going to avoid the present fight. So we can construct, and then of course there are loops, so you can trigger yourself. So if I, if I occurred in this fight, I'm more likely, if there's a loop here, self-loop, I'm more likely to occur in that fight as well. Cause my own, I'm more likely to treat myself. So the C21 first order markup process circuit that's supported by the data um, looks like this. This is, of course, a subset of the full graph. And um, note that the nodes now, because it's 2-1, two, 2 individuals in the previous time step trigger, um, one individual next have two individuals in them, so flapper and utter. Quest is a strategy that says if flappers are utter occurred in the previous fight, they'll fight, with some probability. Right? And dashed lines are also inhibitory. And I don't have the uh, circuit for the C12, but it's very similar in principle to this one. All right, so essentially we have these circuits now um, that are serving as alternative hypotheses for our output. And again, if you remember, directed edges indicate the receiver node is a fight participation strategy tuned to the center node of the meter. The strategies are probabilistic, so it makes the game theoretic sense, but not at the level of strategy classes. And we're trying to uh, recover this output. We're going to build a generative model using each one generative model for each of these circuits, where we try, where we get a distribution of, um, we get a time series of, of fights, and then we look at the distribution of fight sizes generated in each simulation, and we ask which can recover um, the observed distribution of fight sizes. Okay, there's one thing I have to tell you though before I tell you a little bit more about the simulation, and that is, of course, that you may have um, you may have realized that in this system the fights can involve many individuals. So, in this case, between two and thirty. So these are multi-party interactions. Now, consider the C21 strategies. If the delta P is positive, it means the probability that AB essentially tells C to join the next fight. It's negative is probably the AB tells you to avoid the next fight. What happens if there are many, maybe more individuals than just A and B, and they also have something to say to C? So they also have delta P's with C. What if DE tells C to avoid the fight, but A and B said join? How does C choose between the recommendations of D and D and A and B? So they're conflicting. So does it join or not? And so to deal with this complexity, and I think this is um, bio biologically reasonable, Solution: We introduce a Boolean operator, um, or and, where or is conflict prone. So basically, the idea is that if any of the delta p's, if any of the edges in, in the circuit say join, you go. And the and operator is simply says that you only go if all of your delta p's say go. And that's conflict averse. So you're less likely to be triggered. Strong condition. And of course, you can ex you can explore. Um, Variations on this thing across different trials. Okay, so we use the circuits to build generative models of complex dynamics. And essentially, we have six models, each with three parameters, so C, N, M, and this will be an operator. And this is all summarized here. And where, of course, the delta P's are, from, are being taken from the data and they're being used in our, our simulation, so we, there are fit parameters. And there are many of those for each model. But um, as I said, there are many, many fewer delta P's than. Um, you, than you could have um, potentially. There are many, many less, many fewer strategies than it, um, it is actually possible. And then this is just the uh, Boolean operator, and this just summarizes the coordination and memory component for those of you who are interested in cognition. Um, 
Okay, so what do we do? Um, there are lots of little variations on this, but basically the, um, uh, we draw a C pair from um, the data, and um, then we let a conflict um, erupt, essentially based on the delta P's going out from that C pair. So they, those, all the delta P's associated with that C pair can trigger other individuals. And um, we let that run, counting the number of individuals that appear at each step uh, and to get our fight sizes. And we let that run until the cascade sort of just peters out. And then we run the simulation again and we build up this um, distribution of fight sizes in this way. Okay? So you do that for each of these um, six models. Or else we have like cycles or something like that. Uh, <laughs> the cycle deep doesn't matter because we're just we're just um, counting the number of individuals that appear in the fight. So if you appear you're triggered more than well you wouldn't be triggered more than once because you count each step. So I trigger you, that's fight one. You trigger the two guys behind you, that's the next fight. And we count how many individuals appear in each of those fights. Okay. So here are the results. This is a kind of complicated slide. So again, this is our data in red. Fight sizes. And the reason, just to uh, come back to an earlier question, the reason we're, we're considering only fights of size 3 and larger instead of fights of size 2 is just because of the way that the simulation was um, built. So, since we have that seed pair, we're biasing the results of the simulation to fights of size 2. So, in these results here, we don't consider fights of size 2. We have redone the simulation a number of different ways where we don't have that problem, and the results are basically the same. Okay, so what you see is this is a C, C11 and more, both cases, and this is a confidence interval associated with this. And you see C11 generates only small fights. C12 and and more generates small and large fights. We say it produces some forest fires. The same is true for C21 or, in orange there, um, large and small fights. And the one that um, recovers except for the tail data pretty well is C21 and. And uh, uh, I wouldn't talk about this, but of course, we're very careful about um, uh, some, some model selection issues. And so this plot tells us a couple things. It tells us the strategy, the primary strategy that um, individuals are using that seems to be responsible for generating that distribution of fight sizes. So in this case, in this monkey group, the C21 more strategy. So it's a triadic strategy where individuals are making decisions based on, <coughs> they're making decisions to join or avoid fights based on what pairs and their, uh, their allies and adversaries are doing the previous fight. And it tells us what the implications, given the parameters that we, have, you, we get from our data, are for each of these strategies for the type of um, fight size distributions that you can get. So you can see that, given the parameters in our data, a C21 only generates small fights. So as a strategy, it's, um, you know, it, it doesn't generate those big costly fights. So maybe that's a good thing. Of course, you individuals can only tune to what they um, can only tune in the pairwise sense. They can only make decisions based on what particular individual is doing. They can't take into account, or they're not taking into account what their pair, their allies and adversaries are doing with each other. So it has a kind of cost and benefit. A cost in the sense that it um, doesn't it doesn't allow this more sophisticated tuning. It's not a sophisticated strategy. And a benefit in the sense it doesn't produce large funds. And C12 you see, and C21 more generate these very large fights. And of course, this poses all sorts of interesting problems for conflict intervention and conflict management, which are very, are very important strategies for keeping conflicts under control in these systems. So there's policing in the system where third parties intervene and break up fights, and one of the things we're interested in is whether the type of strategy individuals are using influences the efficacy of the conflict management strategy. So this summarizes some of what I've just said. So here we have the functional implications of the, of the results, um, the strategy classes, the behavioral description, consequence for output in terms of the types of fights that are generated and cascades, and these two things um, we're very interested in. So thinking about these consequences in terms of robustness and social stability, and in terms of, as I said, the um, best intervention strategy. So our strategies, our intervention strategies like policing, um, able to work, you know, for C21, which uh, occurs in this system. And maybe they're not as effective for C12 because you can't break up those large fights if you're a single individual. So there's all sorts of interesting questions you can ask about the relationship between the strategies individuals are using in their decisions, their conflict decisions, and the kinds of conflict management mechanisms that are required given those strategies. All right. So coming towards the end of the talk, so just to remind you of what we mean by collective computation, so you've got 
some input. We have this resource lens that describes the strategies or decision making rules individuals are using and in terms of markup processes in this case. And the algorithmic description is this combination of decision making rule and the circuit topology, which I'm going to say a word about in a few moments. And then the output that we, uh, that we think is interesting for some reason. Okay, so what's the utility of this inductive game theory approach? So over here, I just uh, made a schematic that sort of uh, breaks this down into the scales uh, of the system that we find in this monkey group. So we have rules at the microscopic level. We have this mesoscopic level, which is um, the circuit level. And then we have our macroscopic level. And one of the things we're thinking about is rewrite um, systems for the rules. So thinking about the rules in terms of production rules, like grammars and language, so that we can embed the rules in a more neutral mathematical Space and study their complexity and make comparisons across groups and species. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And um, what we also see is that you may want, in fact, if you're interested in the relationship between microscopic and macroscopic um, features and whether what that implies about structure and complexity, you may need different complexity measures for each of these scales because the, the, the representation of the behavior at each scale is quite different. So here it's very statistical, here it's a circuit, and here we have these rules. And so, you know, you need something like a network complexity um, measure there, whatever that might be. And then maybe here you need something like minimum description length like or some kind of algorithmic complexity measure. This is just very um, uh, preliminary, but it's something that we're pushing a little bit on, uh, thinking about complexity, complexity measures in different kinds of scales. So, and along those lines, so the utility of IT is that in allowing us to extract the strategy and the game structure here is like a, a one shot, many one shot games. And we can construct circuits of these buildings that describe how the strategies combine to reach such a structure. And we also get from adopting this approach, instead of assuming the scales a priori, we get them out of the analysis. So we learn the extent to which the microscopic, and I'm going to come back to this in just a minute, and the mesoscopic, the circuit topology, um, are, are making causal contributions to the macroscopic observable. So it might be the case that, in fact, the circuit level in terms of something more interesting than just the distribution of strategies, the distribution of delta p's, it's more interesting topology, the circuit doesn't really matter. And in, in other cases, maybe that topology is really important. I mean, perhaps in the unchained regulatory circuits. And then, um, as I said, this gives us a way to think about, in a more, I think, more principled way, starting point of thinking about complexity measures. Uh, we might formal, how we might amend formal complexity measures to work on data, uh, or um, new ones. And of course, um, down the road, we can look at the evolutionary developmental dynamics of the rule of the surface. That's really what we're, we're interested in, but that's we're a very long way from here. Okay, so just to give you an example of um, some sort of practical utility, in the Eric Davidson case, he's comparing the sea urchin subcircuits that are um, found in both the sea urchin and the starfish, right? And asking about know, why they were concerned. Here we can ask, I mean, the most obvious one is to compare different macaque species. There are 20 or so macaque species with different social structures, different conflict management mechanisms, and different, it appears, different strategies for, for um, conflicts. The macaque and the the one that I talked about today, or at least the, the group that I study, is, appears to be using the C21 rule, at least with respect to um, bite size distribution. And we can ask the same question of macaque mulata, recent monkeys, which have a more despotic system or are much more aggressive. Are they using C11? You know, how does that affect their distribution of fight sizes? And can we say something about, if we can rewrite these rules, can we say something about the complexity of the decision making rules in each case? Okay, so refinements on the IGT, um, on this IGT project. So the circuit logic, of course, is, is, um, is the one we're focusing on uh, most heavily. So, as I said, the causal contribution of the distribution of strategies versus the topological properties of the circuit to the macroscopic observable. So, do any higher order properties of the circuit actually matter? And, uh, and our data right now um, suggests that what's most important in the preliminary result is, is the distribution of those pieces and, and not higher order properties. Um, so, are the edges binary? No. Oh, so the edges are built at the edges, the weights are delta p's, but you have the binary part comes from Boolean operator. Because in the end, since you're combining, so um, you, know, you have all these delta p's, some of them are conflicting, 
and then so you have the operator on top of those delta p's, and it ends up making a decision by okay. So the delta p's could be by hand. It would be the same as If, well, we play, it's not, it, it doesn't, if you, um, so if you change the weight to the delta p's, the results do change. And it's because it changes, it, ch it changes how the Boolean operator uh, op works. So um, another thing we're, we're working on is the long fraction is a very crude macroscopic property. And what our results suggest is that there are many circuits that can give you a particular um, distribution of bite sizes that we've observed. Now, uh, an important question is, yes, there are many different um, combinations of delta p's that we don't observe in the data that can give us that bite size distribution. How confident are we that the delta p's in our data are um, measured correctly? Right? So that's, that's an important question. I mean, we can threshold the delta p's, we can um, make them uniform, and, um, and are those realistic? Are those legitimate? Are those legitimate assumptions given that we have the delta p's actually from the data? It's an issue that we've been playing around quite a bit. Okay. Circuit dimension reduction. So do individuals store the lookup table, they know all those delta p's. Now, like I said, they don't have they don't have to remember the full set of possible delta p's. Or they, there's no indication they're doing that. But they do seem to have delta p's for uh, a large number of individuals and pairs, a relatively large number. So are they remembering all of those delta p's for specific individuals and subgroups, or are they um, are learning some kind of more coarse-grained rule? And we explore this a little bit by shuffling the values of the, of the, um, of the weight in the C11 and C the edges in the C11 and C21 strategies, um, and it looks like it looks like um, it looks like they, the edges do matter. It looks like they do remember, maybe not the precise value of the delta p, but they do have delta p's for specific individuals and subgroups. And so, a way they might be corresponding, for example, is basically all subdel males they accord, they have the same delta p for, or all. Um, so the females are all females from the same natural line. There are lots of sort of biological ways they might group individuals together that we you know, we've been trying to do as, as a way to reduce the complexity of that of that strategy space. Circuit dimension reduction. So compression. So and, um, there's a lot of noise in our time series, and you can you can um, use various algorithms like sparse coding from neuroscience to extract the predictable and regular subgroups and um, individuals, and then recode the time series using only those groups gives you a, a much reduced um, time series. And then you can try and um, look, extract the delta p's from that time series. And, and in that way, you get a much smaller circuit and um, with hopefully larger delta p's. But of course, the problem is, is that even though it's technically still a first order Markov process, it isn't really a first order Markov process anymore because you are now about fights that are um, adjacent in your recoded time series that were not adjacent in the real time series. So they could be separated by a very, very long peaceful interval. And um, if you're thinking about, you're justifying the first order markup process based on cognition. So we're not, we're limiting our, um, we're only considering first order instead of higher order markup processes precisely because we don't think the individuals can remember across all those conflicts. We're, um, we're violating that assumption a little bit when we recode this time series using um, sparse coding uh, As I said, the circuit neural complexity measures, and, um, and we're thinking about some implications for this. Rather annoying debate in cognitive science on recursion. Okay, and we work on IGT foundations, so a little bit of um, work on the relationship between IGT and Bayesian inference. We will eventually get to extracting or trying to extract payoffs from the data, and um, we're interested in the stability and time scales of the strategies. So, by that I mean the delta p's do vary in time. If we we we've looked, we extracted the delta p's from the entire aggregated data set, and of course, if you look across observation days you see variation in those strategies. And the question before us is, is that variation due to noise, limited data? Is it due to refinement in the use of the strategies? Or is it due to change in the opportunity to use the strategies? And disentangling those two possibilities is, is very hard, especially with the quantum of data that we have. Super interesting question. Um, cognition and tuning. So individual estimation of macroscopic properties. Of course, we always um, we're, 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 we're always we're always talking about individuals um, using only local information, and very rarely do we say what that is beyond making the assumption that they can only use maybe the direct connections to their local network. In some of our analyses and other analyses that I've been talking about today, we have some indication that, for example, the animals know something about their relative power scores, 
that they, where they're not, with, which would mean they have to look over the network and look more than their, their first degree connections um, in order to get that information. So what kinds of information do they actually have access to? Can they, and what kinds of signals can they extract? And how do they use this information to est make estimates of um, max scale properties? Uh, finally, of course, the collective computation. Um, one of the interesting questions there is if, if we can uh, build these circuits successfully, how did the circuits evolve? How did they change? And can individuals or subgroups or the group collectively, by changing their behavior, change the circuit to generate um, a different, maybe more desirable or adaptive um, macroscopic problem? Better distribution of flight settings in terms of its cost for, for individuals and kind of subgroups. And finally, we have the internet. So here are uh, my collaborators. So Dave Carter is my primary collaborator. Eddie Lee is um, a really super smart um, grad, um, undergraduate who just graduated from Princeton. With, he's a Bill Bialik with his mentor, and Bill's a great guy. And he works with us now, and he, um, he's done a lot of his um, IBT work. He started the IBT work with Simon Day, who's a postdoc at Santa Fe Institute. Brian has worked with us on the compression, um, sparse coding stuff, and um, on the IBT. Um, we work on this causal network stuff with NEOT, and then um, we were funded by NSF, and Donald, and Mitch Thompson, this work. And finally, just a word about the Center for Complexity and Computation, and um, we sit at the intersection of, of these fields, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. something earlier about um, somehow being able to produce a power law distribution of byte sizes and how that might be adopted somehow. I wonder, um, can these kind of just two pair or one pair interaction networks produce a power law or what would that mean or what would the microscopic structure have to look like? So the heavy tail distribution is in the power structure case, uh, not in the um, byte size distribution. And there, so what is the question exactly? So let me see if it's relevant to the power structure case. Um, it seems like I, I just wonder what kind of microscopic dynamics could produce that because it seems like these pairwise are probably not. Oh, okay. So in the power case, which is uh, quite different from this one, what you have is individuals, they have a history of agonistic interactions, and then when there's a large asymmetry, when one individual perceives a large asymmetry, it starts giving a subordination signal. And the subordination signal means that it essentially creates this kind of proto contract, which it will yield if a conflict does arise. So it's not just submission. And so it's a slowly changing variable. And as such, you, you get a network of subordination signals that don't that are um, very stable, very stationary. And encoded in that network is this heavy tail distribution of power. And the, um, the way that the way that the power is encoded in the network we've, is essentially through a kind of um, we've, we've looked at a number of different algorithms for reading the power structure out of the network. They're all consensus formalisms. And it looks like the way we define power is um, the degree of agreement or consensus in agreement about whether an individual can use force successfully. And that's measured in terms of the signals in this network. And it, it turns out that individuals, um, the most powerful individuals, are those that receive many signals from many individuals. And in this particular group, where we have the heavy tail distribution of power, there are a few individuals who are before, per, perceived to be disproportionately affected in fight and fights. And they sit in the tail of that power distribution. So it's like there's a um, collective perception that these individuals are um, 
able to win fights, and that's what that's what generates the heavy notice to machine in the power case. So I don't I think it's a, that's a much more specific answer than we would like, but that's um, that's the process in the power case. Yeah. As you alluded to, um, you're able to find some sort of correlation and then use those in a simulation to produce a similar distribution that's not that convincing that those are actually the important uh, microscopic rules that are involved. So what's not, what's not convincing? It's not convincing that, that C21 and are the, are the really relevant microscopic rules that are involved. Those are some correlations you see. So the correlations are caused by strategies. So we were, we were able to show at the pairwise level, at the, at the edge level, that they're causal. That individuals decide to fight, in this case. Well, how, well, your evidence for that was that it reproduced the same distribution. No, no, no. That's why I said there's causality at two levels in this in this um, in this work. So the first um, the first level is the strategy level. So that's where we extract the strategies from the data, and they're directed correlations. So they're already different from a normal correlation because it makes the trade time. And then they're different because we are looking at two of the four rules, and then we use the various null models to rule out um, uh, the correlations. Just these directed correlations are spurious, right? And so what that leaves us with is um, a list of strategies, probabilistic strategies that, that individuals have for responding with their decision to join a fight, that they use in their decision to join a fight. So the delta P, which is the weight on this edge, it justifies you writing an edge between these two individuals and gives you the weight on that edge, is says that fortune, with some probability, will fight if it be appeared in the previous fight. Okay, so if, if, the, if those are really the relevant microscopic rules that you expect, if you do a simulation, you can look at other statistical measures, not just the distribution of fight sizes. Yes, that we have. And so that's true, exactly. So I think you said somewhere we look at many fine grained statistics. So of course, the macroscopic property is very, is um, maybe easily recoverable. Although, if, if you notice, it wasn't recoverable at all, given the parameters from our data with the other strategies. They're, they can, they come nowhere close to it. But those are just some strategies you can imagine. Like. Those are, well, they're not some, they're from the data. But you can you imagine. You can do longer range correlations, you can do more than just two, one, Okay, right, but you, we don't because the animals, there's no evidence in this system the animals are using um, CNMP or higher order marker classes. So you can do all those things. But what I'm saying is that you want to restrict the search space in some principled way. And we're, we're, I think what our data suggests is you're very unlikely to, to um, it's computationally hard to do that, and you're also very unlikely to find that those, those work because of the cognitive processing, the processing ability of the components of the system. It might work for another system. So what we have are, these, these are causal, these edges. This is a circuit. These are it's not just an interaction network. These are causal edges. And then the question is, is this circuit, and there's a lot of features of this circuit, is this circuit responsible for producing the, the macroscopic property of those fine grain statistics? And we evaluate that by building a simulation using this circuit from the data. Right? So it's a simulation parameterized by the data. Yeah. And, and then we ask if any of these circuits can recover our mi micro and macroscopic statistics. So what fine grain? What fine grain statistics? We look at the frequency of appearance of, of individuals in pairs. There's a whole range of small um, statistics that we look at. And so they're quite hard to, to capture. And they all agree just as well as the macroscopic? Well, we use different techniques, so I can't say they agree in the same way, but the, they're in agreement that CT1 is the best draft. In this case, we have other circuits that I discuss here uh, based on the, the tech where other circuits we constructed from the sparse coded time series, where we you know, extract the regular unpredictable individuals. Uh, where we add noise to the circuits and ask whether we can recover the fine grain and, and coarse macroscopic observables with those circuits. And um, there are there is one circuit in those class, in that class of circuits that works. So, and so it turns out that the noise is very important, but we're not sure if this is um, if this is a real result because we don't know we haven't decided yet whether the edges in this circuit are really meaningful with respect to our data. Because you could you could as I said you could construct lots of circuits by playing with the delta P's and recover some of these statistics. But those, the, the, the edge weights in those circuits don't correspond to anything in the system. And so this is a tension, is sort of navigating, since we have the data, I mean, often you make those assumptions in the absence of the data. You have to like, have the data, you go to a simple null model with uniform distribution of weights in the circuit and see if you can recover your observable, but we have the microscopic data. So the question is, are, you know, are, is it right for us to ignore that data? How much confidence do we have in that microscopic what is the imaging and what the biological motivation is for the improvement of our process or is it something higher? So there are two things. One is that um, uh, we don't have any evidence right now with 
one caveat for long range correlations in the fight. And two, based on what we know about the animals' cognitive and study animal behavior, um, the animals, uh, it, it seems unlikely that they're using, um, uh, they're making decisions to fight based on what happened several times. Well, but there's a, so there's a hidden trick here, and that is that although it's a first order markup process, it can be the case that the preceding and the triggering event is a sort of summary statistic that describes um, a whole history of social interactions. Right? And so I think that's what's going on here. So it's not that they're remembering who was involved in fight back, fight back um, two bouts or three bouts specifically, but they, they're building up these summary statistics, they're storing the summary statistics, and they're responding to those. And that's, you know, I mean, technically it's. Um, it's indistinguishable from what we've done here, but biologically it's very important. That's the distinction. Yeah. yeah. Is the CNN rule uh, in, <coughs> sorry, intrinsic for this species, or for example, if we just uh, have a, a equal number of uh, individuals form a new group, and uh, can we predict that they will form the same structural structure? Oh, if we took the individuals out and put them in a new group? Yeah. Well, if we took the same individuals and put them in a new group, I imagine that they, yeah, there would be some period. Uh, not the same individual, but maybe the same size. Uh, you mean different if you, group, not the same size. If you reconstituted, would we find the same thing in a group of the, another group of the same size? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, it would depend on lots of things, like the distribution of fighting abilities, how um, stable the alliance network is. There are lots of things that go into determining lots of um, both in transient and intransient, stable and unstable factors, and actually varying factors, that go into determining whether individuals win or lose fights. And um, even though the group size would be the same, unless those other things were the same, I, I would expect a lot of difference. Now that said, you do see, and this, this is based on really just a small number of groups, you do see across the Kappa Mulata and across the Kappa Nova screen, and you see similar social structures. And you know, many people say this is species typical social structure. It's like biologically driven by some kind of gene expression patterns. And I think there might be an element of truth to that, but I also think there's a lot of um, feedback from the microscopic behavior, the actual behavioral patterns, to the social structure that constrains the space of social structures that these groups explore. So that means it might be difficult to repeat these experiments. So there are lots of challenges in repeating these experiments, um, but you can you can build groups like, for example, if you wanted to repeat the policing knockout experiment that was alluded to at the beginning of this talk or was mentioned, um, you could do that by uh, finding groups that have a similar distribution of power, since we think that's the critical factor. So if you know something about what you think the critical social property is, and you can identify groups with those social properties, you're in a better position to do replication. Yes. Yeah. I was wondering what the kind of, um, I guess, the residual variance is in terms of predicting kind of fight joining or not um, after you account for this kind of the statistically significant and how you how that's incorporated when you simulate the kind of macroscopic um, fight size distribution. So it doesn't need to be incorporated when we simulate the, the fight size distribution because all we're doing is using these rules and asking whether the time series, the fight distribution generated in the simulated time series has the same statistical properties, or some of the same statistical properties as the observed one. But um, your question about how much predictability there is is a really interesting one. And in the sparse coding work that we've done, uh, where we first ask, before we even get to this IGT stuff, whether we can use this technique for neuroscience to figure out the predictable individuals, um, predictable regular individuals and subgroups, whether there are such individuals in our time series, what we found was a bit surprising, and that is that um, there was a relatively small number of predictable individuals and subgroups. And once we had those individuals, if we divided the data set in half, essentially, and asked, we use those individuals to predict um, fights out of sample, we could only predict at about 15% membership of those fights. And what, what, it, what it turns out to be the case is that many of the fights in the system are, are unique. And of course, there are, you know, there are, in the sense that there are many vectors that are identical, right? Fight participation vectors. And so the challenge is, there's this challenge of knowing whether you have, you have um, written down the right model or whether you have um, simply a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, um, you have a lot of randomness in your data set. Right? So when I say 
it looks like that 15% is not really a small number because it's 15% given the fact that there are many, many unique fights and hence many unpredictable fights. Is that true of the simulation? So do you still get, if you do 1,100 fights in a simulation, do you get a lot of them most of them unique? Uh, yes. But not as unique because, um, because we're only using the delta P's. So we're only using the predictable um, pairs. And so one of the, there's an interesting, there's an interesting set of issues here. One of the reasons why we think we can't recover the, um, so if you, if you remember from the slide of the results, the results of the simulation, you saw that the fit and the tail is not very good. Yeah. And um, there are a couple things that could be going on there. One is we don't have very many big fights in our data set. There are some. And they're very interesting when they occur. But so it could be noise. And another possibility, which we're um, getting to with this recoded time series, is that they're actually, when fights are large, they're really using mixed class, strategy classes there. And so you need to build a simulation where you allow both where there's some noise, because individuals in large fights are more easily, more easily pushed over the edge to sort of randomly. And two, um, they're, they're, because there are many more individuals in the fight, they're using a larger class of strategies. And the only way we can explore that is by um, somehow reducing the space of delta P's that we around, so some kind of venture reduction. And we've been able to do that with the sparse, with the sparse coding approach. So we can, we can, when we recode the time series, into these predictable regular groups, that gives us the strategy space, and it's already a mixed class strategy space. So we don't have to limit ourselves to C11 or C21. We can we, we sort of get all the strategies from what's left in the time series. And so um, and we're able to recover some, some of the statistics that way, but we have this, this first order Markov interpretation problem because the effects are separated potentially by long principle. Did you only look at things that you C21 and did you look at combinations like C21 and C12? No, so that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. So with, with the, without doing the recoding and compression of the time series, it's very hard to ask that question. It's computation to consider because the, the strategy space is the key. What would key camera simulation be those? No. Not, with the mix, not on the full data set with the mixed strategy. Okay, because of the computation of the time you can do it when you recode the time series using this compression yeah. But there are costs to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what you answered according to cycles. You said it, it, it doesn't matter because you only want the number of individuals fighting. You mean the self loops? Uh, no. So when you iterate this. So oh, in the simulation? Yeah. So you either get fixed points or cycles. No, no. You, um, so I think you're. So what you do is you get you draw the C pair. Um, there are delta p's associated with that C pair, so that triggers subsequent individuals um, from joining. And uh, all the individuals that are initially triggered by that C pair, that's fight one, and you count them up. And then they trigger a bunch of individuals, and that's fight two, and you count all the individuals they trigger, and so forth. And when does it stop? It stops. Well, eventually you just it, the delta p's are small, so eventually there's no more animals to trigger. So, I mean, if the delta P's have been very large, the fights would have gone on and on and on, but they're very tiny. A lot of them are very small. So, the, so eventually the cascade just ends. And then we run the simulation again, we build up the time series as well. Does it always end? Or? Yeah, it always ends. Okay. <laughs> would you expect it would be the property of whatever is motivating that fight that would be the. I mean, isn't that distribution like an equilibrium distribution? Not really like a. Well, so an important question is how stationary the distribution is. Yeah. And so this distribution was collected over a four-month period, and um, it seems pretty stationary. But as I said, the distribution of delta p's may be changing for one of the three reasons I gave: refinement of strategy, or changes of strategy, or, or it could just be noise. We don't know. But what we so if the distribution of strategy is changing, that means that the the, the, the long the distribution of fight sizes could also be changing. The question is, what's the time scale relationship between those two things? And the second question is, given that we know that the, the, that distribution is kind of degenerate, it may be that you need a real shift at the delta p level before you see a change in the price distribution. Uh, right, but I guess also it seems that the long term distribution according to the model is in the price. Why is that? Because you said they go to zero. You might have some stochastic, correct? Oh, oh, I oh yeah, absolutely. That's, that's I see right. And so, like, we've considered other simulations where there's a uniform probability of uh, regression occurring. I see. In which case, you'll yeah, just get a good point. Yes. 
Yep. Um, have you considered like doing ad hoc stuff on like different parts of the the output distribution, like considering like how C one one is like predicting the smaller fights and how, for example, just isolating on a C N like five one on the bigger one towards the tail end of the distribution. Sorry, if, like, if it's computation, you're I'm sorry. Can you say that? I missed it because of the door. Ah, uh, sorry. Um, have you considered doing like ad hoc like um, selection of the strategies to test based on like different parts of the distribution? Like for example, if you, you have the great the bigger fights, uh -huh. have you considered you know just putting in the strategies for C five one or for like the C one one and just like the small fights? If you can't put them all together. Like. Well, we can put them all together. As I, I was saying in response to the question up front, when we do the uh, recode, when we recode the time series and the compression technique, that gives us back a time series that sort of defines the mixed class strategy space because it's, it's reduced. So, so we can explore that, but there's just cost to doing that because it's not, I mean, it's like I said, technically a first order markup process, but has this a hidden assumption or a hidden problem where the fights are now separated potentially by a very long peaceful period. And so we're assuming that the animals, the delta p's that we find, they're, they, they're small, I think, because of that reason, um, are, are legit, are real. You know, and, and so the signal is weaker in that case because of the fights are separated by it. So that's the cost of um, our solution so far for exploring the mixed class strategies. But, but Eddie, the Princeton student I mentioned, is very interested in the noise in the data. And so in large fights and, and trying to sort of disentangle the kinds of noise in the data set. Related to your question, we'll see where it gets with it. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. Um, if how do you identify the uh, significant deltas? Because you imagine if you know the decision to fight is always independent, and you exclude them at 90 percent probability, then you would expect about 10 percent to be significant, and you see that about 10 percent of all possible edges are in that picture. So I wonder if. I'm sorry. So you see that 10 percent what? You know, if, if the decisions to join a fight are always independent, mm -hmm. and then you try to find the significant deltas that. I don't know, 90% confidence interval, um, then you would get a graph that looks approximately like, like that, just randomly, just because about 10% of the edges would be there. Um, so I'm not understanding something. So the way we get the delta P's is we shuffle the time series, and we, um, so the delta P like, is uh, the you know, difference between the real data and the shuffle time series for the, um, so, you know, B follows A minus B follows A in the null divided by the number of times A occurs in the data, right, for that. And goes to B. And then we have um, you know, many run, many instances of that, and we find um, we, we take the delta that are above the 0.05. But, but so if they were completely random, wouldn't you still expect to get 5% of them to just randomly look significant? But that's exactly why we do this procedure. So that's, that's what our null uh, eliminates. But you're that's doing it on many, many tests, right? It's like a bond for only correction. Uh -huh. So Question. that's exactly what we're doing with the null, eliminating the ones that we would expect to be significant. Do you have a, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, if you do evolution like that, I'm excited about what you would be selecting for. What you would be selecting for? So, um, well, let me answer that question by saying what I'm interested in there is in, um, so in the, like in New York Davis, in case you get this conservation of these subcircuits. So are there, how, how would you, you know, what elements of the circuit are changing, how, depending on how the um, strategy individuals views are changing, and what elements of the circuit would be conserved as a, even as the strategies change. So it's a kind of question, I don't know what the, um, what, you'd be selecting circuit topology, and you'd be selecting strategy class, I guess. We don't have any biological uh, Biological reasons in this 
particular population group to think too much of the And then the second question was. Don't worry about it. I think we should think about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, guys.